Because, see, I personally believe that the church has said for a long time that we want God's best. We want to walk in God's best. We want to talk in God's best. We want to live in God's best. But, see, the fact of the matter is I don't think there's any one Christian who would say, no, you're right. You know, I really don't want God's best for my life, Brother John. You see, I don't, I don't really want that. I don't think anybody is going to be saying that. But even though nobody will say they want less than, the truth is that a lot of people are settling for less than. Are you with me tonight? See, I think one of the reasons why that's the case is because in most spaces and places, too many people are focused on making people shout and making people feel good instead of giving and learning a substance to stand behind the shout. See, they focus too much on wanting to make people feel good, letting them pat them on the back and tell them everything's just okay. Instead of saying, hey, instead of just a shout on Sunday, I need something that's going to sustain me on Monday. I need something when I get up and I open my front door and the devil's waiting on me right there where I can say, not today, devil. I ain't got to say, boy, it wasn't yesterday good and walk out my door and get knocked right down because now I've got a substance I can stand on behind the shout and that's what we're trying to do here because see in a lot of places they come ready to shout on Sunday morning or they come just to check off their religious box of the week but they're not being equipped to face the battle that they're going to face when they walk out that door on Monday morning see and I believe that because of this a lot of ground has been taken by the enemy in this spiritual war we are in and church I've said it before I'll say it again we are in a war and we do have an enemy and honestly a lot of people don't realize this but our enemy is not a little man in a spandex red suit with two horns and a pitchfork waiting to jump out from behind the bushes and yell boo at you that's not who he is. See, his name is the devil, and he's out to steal from you. He's out to kill you. He's out to destroy you. And I personally believe that it's time for the church of Jesus Christ to stand up and be counted and get a hold of our marching orders and storm the very gates of hell and take back what he's stolen and rebuild what he's destroyed and resurrect what he's killed. It's time to declare war. So everything we do this year will be about war. Because, see, I intend to step into 2024 better than I stepped into 2023. Maybe it's just me. I don't know. Maybe your life is just perfect. Maybe your family like the Waltons. Maybe your bank account's fat. <laughs> maybe your health is just A-OK. -okay. And maybe you ain't got nothing you can do that'll improve on your life. But for the rest of us, it's time to declare war. So this month, honestly, I feel like we've been in like a spiritual boot camp. I really feel like that we've been like in some intense spiritual training. And I know we ain't really shouted a whole lot this month. Trust me, we're going to shout a little bit next month. We're going to do a series starting next week called Warfare One. Not O-N-E, but W-O-N. Oh, I thought y'all would like that a little bit better. Now. We're going to talk about how we're fighting... Not for the victory. We're fighting from the victory. We're going to talk about the fact that that tomb is empty. We're going to talk about the fact that he, he was on a cross, but he rose again on the third day. And he's already won the warfare. So that's what we're going to be talking about. So we're going to be doing some shouting in, I believe. But see, it's my prayer that this series has been one where we've been able to see some principles and get some things to help us recognize who the enemy is. And not just recognize who he is, but how he operates in this war that we're in with him. So tonight is going to be the final part in our series called Warfare Revisited. And the message tonight is this, the weapons of his warfare, part two. The weapons of his warfare, part two. Is this sounding like in a barrel or something? Because I'm like here like it's echoing. Okay, it's echoing. Yeah, let me get a microphone here. Is that better? All right, awesome. Awesome. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, okay. All right. Now, are you with me so far? Okay, cool, cool. All right, so tonight we're going to be talking about the weapons of his warfare part two. 
Now, as we step into this introduction, we're jumping right back into the text we started this morning where we see Jesus is having a conversation with the religious leaders. And see, the fact of the matter is, who he's talking to is just as important as what he said. Jesus is talking to religious leaders, and he's talking to them about identity and how they act, and, and he makes this what most would consider a harsh statement. See, my wife tells me sometimes, she says, you know, you're just brutally honest. But see, I believe that I'm not the only one who's brutally honest because Jesus was not one to hold back when it came to speaking truth. And he spoke to them very blunt because he loved them and he wanted their eyes to be open. And sometimes in order to get through to people, you can't put any sugar on it, folks. There are certain conversations you need to say what needs to be said and you need to say it the way it needs to be said. And the reason why that is is so the people who's hearing what you're saying can hear and understand the importance and the urgency of what you're trying to get across. So he tells them in John chapter 8 and verse 44, he said, now you might not know this, but you are of your father the devil you see now he didn't create you he didn't create you now but he's your father because you're looking like him you might not be worshiping him but you will but you're looking like him you might not claim him but you're acting like him because see the fact of the matter is you can look and act like people who you don't claim And this is what Jesus is trying to get them to say. He's saying, hey, your intentions and your motives are okay, but your actions ain't. Because you can have the right motives but the wrong actions. Just because you didn't mean to say it that way doesn't mean that you didn't say it that way. Just because you wasn't trying to hurt my feelings doesn't mean that my feelings ain't hurt. So Jesus is telling them, you resemble him. And then he says this, he was a murderer from the beginning. See, he's saying he was responsible for death. He was responsible for spiritual death, emotional death, death of joy, death of peace, and ultimately Adam and Eve's physical death. And then it says this, this is how, it, Jesus tells us how he did it. Because he goes on in the same verse to say, not holding to the truth. I've got to say something powerful here, church. Because what changes your life is not the truth we hear, but the truth we hold. Because Jesus said earlier in John 8, if you hold on to my teaching, then you're my disciples indeed. So it's not necessarily what we hear, it's what we hold on to. It's not what we amen, it's what we hold on to. It ain't what we shout about, it's what we hold on to. It ain't what causes us to run, it's what we hold on to. It ain't what causes us to dance, it's what we hold on to. Am I making sense? And he says, not holding on to the truth, for there is no truth in him. All right, let me read that again because you missed a great place to shout. Not holding on to the truth, for there is no truth in him. Okay, one more time. Okay. Not holding on to the truth, for there is no truth in him. Okay, that's better, but I think you just did that because you know I wanted you to shout right there. All right, so let me give you the shout, okay? Okay, let me give you the shout right here. See, what that means is that whatever the enemy says to you, it's a lie. You remember the old saying, the devil is a liar? So when he starts whispering in your ear, it's time to shout and rejoice because that means that the exact opposite is true. Oh, Lord. So when he starts telling you, you ain't going to make it, you ought to stand up and give your God a praise because he can't tell the truth. So he says, you ain't going to make it. When he says it ain't going to happen, it means the exact opposite is getting ready to happen because there is no truth in him. So he says that the door's closed forever. We ought to rejoice with thanksgiving because it means that the exact opposite is about to happen happen oh my lord i know i'm in just in the introduction church but is anybody at new day who can just take a few seconds and give your god some praise for the stuff that's getting ready to happen that the enemy said was not going to happen he said it ain't getting any better but he's a liar he said that ain't getting any better but he's a liar he said they ain't getting any better but the devil is a liar Oh, I need to talk to some people that the devil been whispering in your ear trying to get you down and out, discouraged, beat up, beat down, and beat out. But now I declare the devil is a liar. 
There is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language. Because he's a liar and he's the father of them. And this is powerful, church. Because all a lie is, is an attempt at deception. It's an attempt at deception. And sometimes it works. And sometimes it don't. Because there are a lot of people who thought they deceived you. And because you was quiet, oh, we're my honest crowd. <laughs> there have been times when people thought they had successfully pulled off a lie to you because you didn't say anything. <laughs> oh, but they wasn't getting by on anything. <laughs> Anybody ever had somebody tell you something, you just sitting there listening like, you lied. <laughs> Man, you lying. I know better than this. But you sitting there like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> See, they thought they were successful, but they really wasn't. And the enemy's a deceiver. But the question is not, is he going to try to be deceptive? Because he's going to try. The question is whether or not is it going to be successful? Because, see, if deception is successful, it produces death. And this is the, one of the main ways the enemy works. He is a deceiver. See, the enemy, he don't work out in the open church. He don't step out from behind a rock and say, Hey, I'm the devil, and I'm getting ready to try to fool you about something. I'm going to deceive you. I'm going to steal this. I'm going to I'm going to try to kill this. I'm going to try to destroy that. He don't do that. He don't step out and try to fool you into something and say, Hey, do this so you can destroy your life. Do this so you can destroy your marriage. Hey, won't you throw money out here and out there so I'll destroy your finances. He don't operate that way, church. He don't come out and say, I'm going to hurt you and I'm going to destroy you. See, that's not how he operates because our enemy is a deceiver. <laughs> and whatever area I'm deceived in, I'll experience death in that area. He has weapons of his warfare. So we need to know what those weapons are so we can see those weapons and not be deceived by those weapons so that the weapons will not work. See, God told Isaiah, no weapon that's formed. Oh, we love that verse. No weapon that's formed will prosper. Oh, we love that verse. And in the Pentecostal church, we shout about it. We run about it. We dance about it. And we, we do all sorts of things with that verse right there. And I agree, that's an amazing verse. But see, here's the thing. That's prophecy. And prophecy is a statement of what God intends to happen. You see, prophecy is like pregnancy. It's potential. Are you with me on that? Part, prophecy is partnership. See, it's God saying, this is what I want to do. This is what I intend to do. This is what I want to see happen. See, that's his part. But you also have a part. See, your willingness to participate is going to determine whether or not you experience what God's wanting to do. That's what God's seen in Deuteronomy 30, 19, when he says, I set before you two paths, life and death, blessing and cursing. Then it says, if you choose life, if you choose to obey him, then you and your children shall live. And are you with me? In other words, if you choose life, then blessed shall you be in the city. Blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall you be in your going in and your coming out. Blessed shall the fruit of your womb be. And see, most people will shout and get excited about the promise, but i got to honestly look whenever I hear the promise. i got to honestly look at my participation in it because, see, these promises only apply to people who's obeying their part in what God said to do. Because if you choose not to obey... If you choose death, then you see curse, 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 curse. Now, see, the fact is, and this is, I think a lot of people get this twisted, because, see, curse doesn't mean what a lot of people think it means. Because when we think curse, we go back to our childhood and we think about the old witches in the, in the uh, cartoons where they're standing over the boiling pot and stirring and, and, and saying their little chants and stuff, and you see the bats and everything else flying around. You see, we think about that. But see, that's not what cursed is. Cursed means without having divine intervention. Are you with me? It doesn't mean God put some kind of spell on you. It doesn't mean that God's throwing a casting some kind of hex on you. It means that God pulls himself away from the area where you've proven by your actions or the lack thereof that you didn't want him involved in. 
God ain't putting a hex on you. He's saying, look, when you refuse to partner with me in an area, then I'm going to come to the conclusion that you don't want my involvement. I'm not going to hang out where I'm not wanted because I ain't got some kind of self-esteem issues here. So what God will do is he'll refuse to involve himself in the area where you're showing you don't want him involved in. And when he ain't involved, what happens is it opens the door for things to happen in that area. He opens the door for life to happen. And when he ain't involved, it's a cursed system. It will not work out. Things are going to happen. Life is going to happen. And if you just depend on a flawed system of thinking to make sure your needs are met, then you're going to be sadly disappointed because it's a flawed system. But then he says, choose life. Choose life. It's your choice. It's your potential so that no weapon formed will prosper. It's a declaration of what can happen if I participate. But if I just do nothing, then that weapon will prosper. Because <laughs> we can see it in people's lives. And if we're honest, I think some of us can look back over our own lives and see certain times and certain places where the weapons of his warfare did prosper. Maybe I'm the only one to so pray for your weaker brother. Where's my honest crowd? All right, maybe it's just me who hit a season when I was getting beat up, beat down, and beat out. That weapon did prosper. It did knock me down for a while. It did throw me for a loop. But I came today to say, no more devil. I refuse to walk through life and not recognize the weapon he uses anymore. I declare war. I will see his schemes, and I will see his weapons, and I will be victorious. So if I'm going to be successful in this war, then i got to be able to see and know the weapons of his warfare. And we need to expose them so those weapons don't prosper, so the lies don't work. And this morning we looked at some of them, and the first one was false thought patterns. Ways of thinking. Not rooted and grounded in the Bible, but some treat them like their Bible. <laughs> the second one was false religions. I ain't religious, I'm spiritual. I don't need no church. I am the church, which means I don't want to connect myself to anything where I'm going to be held accountable. Now, please don't get me wrong. I know what, pe what some people say that. I understand what they mean, but the Bible is not against religion. The Bible is not against religion. The question is whether or not their religious practices get in the way of a relationship with God or do they promote a relationship with God. There's a huge difference, church, because if any relationship is going to be healthy, there's going to have to be some things that are done religiously. If I'm going to have a good relationship with my wife, there's some things I have to do religiously. You don't believe me? Just quit talking to your husband. See how good your marriage stays. Quit going home at night and see how long your wife stays happy. Now see, by religiously, I mean gladly and habitually because it's the motive behind the motion. Not out of obligation. Okay? Because James talks about pure religion being undefiled. So the question is not whether somebody's religious or not. The question is this. Is their religion perverted or is it pure? Because obligation is perverted. But doing something out of a pure heart is undefiled and pure. Am I making sense tonight? So we can't get caught up in stuff that might be popular but not biblical. So false thought patterns, false religion, but then number three, false ministers. People are deceived by people who mean well but who went in the ministry. Some people went but they wasn't sent. Romans 10, 15. And how shall they preach except they be sent? Some people went, but they wasn't sent. And honestly, the church is the only place where we encourage people to do stuff that we all see they can't do. <laughs> somebody up there singing, somebody in the back saying, sing, baby, sing. And the rest of us like, no. <laughs> y'all act like y'all ain't never been there and done that. All right, well, pray for your weaker brother then. I mean, I'm just saying. I mean, it's the only place where, where we encourage people to do stuff that they don't, that they just can't do. You see? Somebody in the back is saying, do this, do this, and everybody's saying no. See, God's got a place for everybody. 
And he got grace for the place. And if you get in your grace place, you're going to thrive and you're going to be fulfilled and the body's going to be blessed and the body's going to be edified. And the problem in a lot of cases, they emphasize certain gifts and certain callings. And what that can do is it can create a feeling of less than in the body. If I, it, it can feel like if I ain't doing that, I ain't important. So they start hearing God call them to stuff that they really ain't called to. Because the voice of less than can sound a whole lot like the voice of God when we feel unimportant and undervalued. So false ministers, people who mean well, but their teaching deceives people, and it produces death. All right, let's move on from there. So the next weapon, the first one we're going to talk about tonight, it'll be number four, false doctrine. False doctrine. This is how he deceives. Watch this. False doctrine is when people use the Bible, but they don't use it right. <laughs> Watch this. Jesus is talking to some people, and watch what he says to them. They ask Jesus a question, and this is how he responds in Luke chapter 10 and verse 26. He says, what is written in the law? He replied, are you with me? Because, see, then the next question is the most important one. How do you read it? Because some people can quote stuff that they ain't reading right. What's written, but how are you reading it? Are you reading it right Am I making sense tonight, church? Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So if I can divide it rightly, guess what? I can divide it wrongly. And that's how the enemy tried to destroy Jesus. In Matthew 4, everything he used to tempt him was with the word. If you look at Matthew 4, the devil quoted scripture to Jesus. I got to say something that might offend some people. <laughs> but just because they quote in Scripture doesn't mean they ain't the devil. He said, just go on jump. Because the way he says, he gave his angels charge over you so you don't dash your foot against the stone. But this is what Jesus did. Jesus used another Scripture. Jesus said, no, 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 you ain't reading that right. Because the Bible says, do not tempt the Lord your God. So if obeying this one little scripture causes me to break another one, then you ain't reading it right. So don't be impressed by people who throw Bible at you. Yeah, false doctrine. Let me show you what's happening in the world today. 2 Timothy 4, 3. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they'll gather around them a great number of teachers... I could pause and start talking about the Bible buffet there, but I'll move on. They will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. It means that people won't choose places they worship based on God's truth, but they find places of worship that line up with their own. Let me find a place that lines up with what I believe, that teaches the exact thing I believe and the way I believe it. Don't try to stretch me. Don't try to, don't try to push me. Don't try to cause me to think about what I've always been taught. And this is one of the things I think we should always ask ourselves, church. Is that true? Not did it hurt my feelings. Not is that different from what I learned at my last church. Not is that different from what I've been taught my whole life, but is that true? true watch this Acts 17 11 now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true <laughs> so the devil will try to deceive us with false doctrine See, I like what Tony Evans says about, about this thing. He says it this way. You might not like apples, but then you go to a carnival, you go to a fair, and you see those candy apples, and you see those caramel apples or caramel, depending on which side of the county you're from, just dripping with caramel. And you praise the Lord. Mm, mm, mm. Anybody else feel the spirit on that caramel? Mm. Glory, get me to April tonight. Praise the Lord. Mm. But oh, caramel, caramel apples, come on, get me focused here. 
But you go to the fair, you go to the carnival, you see those candy apples, you see those caramel apples. Oh, my Lord, they look so good, they look so tasty. But see, here's the problem. When the apple is dipped in all that sugar from the caramel, it gets robbed of its nutritional value. And see, this is what happens with the enemy. He'll take the truth and dip it in sugar and give it to you, and it tastes good, but there ain't no nutritional value to it. So it's like, ooh, I feel good. And see, that's why people get frustrated with church, because they go and they get made to feel good, or they told some of this stuff they get told, oh, you throw a dollar at it, it's going to be all right. If you just send me $20, I got this water right here that's going to heal everything about you. Oh, you send me a 1000 and God will send you a million. Oh, jump up, turn around, high five five people and God going to turn everything in your life around and all your problems are over. And the problem is we do it because we trust them. And then you leave and it don't work. <laughs> but see, we can't say that at church. We can't say that didn't work. <laughs> so what happens is people silently lose faith in all of church because somebody told them something wrong about some of it. See, it's false doctrine. Do I want something that's going to make me feel good or something that's going to make me better? Do I want a motivational speaker that's going to make me run, dance, and shout, but then I leave and I got to dance but no depth. I got to shout but no substance. But when the storms of life come, I need more than a run. I need roots. I need more than a dance. I need depth. I need more than a shout. I need substance. Are you with me? All right, so false doctrine. All right, you ready for this one? Number five, false disciples. All right, I'm not going to read it all, but it's in Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 28. Jesus tells two parables, but there's this one field where you got wheat and you got tares that grow up together. Everybody's familiar with that parable, right? It's the visible church and the invisible church, the sheep and the goats, the real and the fake, and they all in one place, right? Jesus says, don't you try to figure out who's who, because if you do, you'll pull up the wrong one. Jesus says, don't you do the judging. That's my job to separate who's who, and it's my job for that. They were talking about false disciples. So God's got a field, and he plants wheat. And in the parable, Jesus says this in Matthew 13, 25, the enemy comes in and plants tares in the same field where God plants wheat. See, this is what I've learned. People don't always get bad doctrine from the pulpit. Some of it comes from little snippets from the Bible buffet. Or from www.whoever. Speak, Holy Ghost. And some of that bad doctrine comes from the parking lot prophets. Oh, yeah, I told you that. We went, we're going all in. It's a nice the last part, but we're just going to dive right in. We're going all the way in there, in there. You see, see, some of this junk don't come from preachers. It comes from people who's preaching to you on your lunch break. It comes from people who we love dearly and who's taught us so much about life, but they hold on to stuff and teachings that ain't biblically sound. So people ain't just led astray by ministers. They're led astray by false disciples. As a matter of fact, and this is going to cause some of you to go, hmm. But the devil's never used anybody in the world to push anybody away from church. While we blaming the world, the world ain't why people don't want to come to church. The church is why people don't want to come to church, and that might be uncomfortable, but that's the truth. It ain't because of what somebody who don't go to church did to them. It ain't because of what somebody who don't go to church said about them. It ain't even about what somebody who don't go to church treat, how treated them. It ain't even about what somebody who don't go to church did to themselves. See, this is what the enemy wants. He wants us to be negatively impacted and deceived by people who, number one, give us bad information, but then, number two, who give us bad examples. And this is one of the things that's missing in a lot of places and spaces, especially in the Pentecostal churches where we believe in the gifts of the Spirit and we believe in praising the Lord and we believe in worshiping in spirit and truth. We believe in letting God have his way and it's his house, so we might as well let him have his way, right? And we gather together in his name. And one of the things that's missing in a lot of places and spaces is doctrinal accountability. We don't like to hold people accountable for what they say doctrinally because we don't realize how important our words are. (laughs) 
And I got to, yeah, I got to go here. So it's like, you can have people who don't go to church at all. And then they start coming to a church like New Day. And we got, we had church around here. I mean, we got church, church. I mean, we, we go in. I mean, we, 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 we believe in praising the Lord. We believe in having church. So, and they start coming and the Lord's really working in their lives. But then they can talk to people who got these strong opinions about the way we do things or the way we believe or maybe what they agree with or don't agree with or for whatever reason they want to talk about something. But see, and so they run into that person who's never really been in church and who's finally going to church and instead of celebrating the fact that person is in church, they start saying everything they feel like they want to say about that church and that that person's going to, not realizing they should be happy that that person is going to church. You go where you're growing and being fed. If it's new day, praise the Lord. There's always a seat for you. If it's not, find somewhere where you're growing and being fed, but find somewhere. And what happens is they sound like the Pharisees who's looking at a man who just got healed and he's carrying the bed that used to carry him and their complaint is, why are you carrying your bed on the Sabbath? When they should be shouting that I'm walking. You should be shouting I'm carrying this bed and this bed ain't no longer carrying me. They should be shouting I'm no longer who I used to be. I'm no longer doing what I used to do. I am a new creature. And they should be shouting and not complaining. And that's the devil. It's deception. To get Christians to start attacking their trust in a place that God's proven he's using because that place is changing their life. False disciples. And most church people don't see the devil in that. And we got to see that. We got to smell that church. We got to discern that. That's the enemy. And I know what some people are going to say. I know some people are going to say, but pastor, some of these people are godly people. Yes, they are. And I'm not saying they ain't saved, but I am saying the enemy can use anybody. Jesus looked at Peter and said, get thee behind me, Satan, for you're an offense to the things of God. What Jesus was saying is, he wasn't saying, he he was saying, you ain't a bad person, you just had a bad moment. Does that make sense? All right, number six, false morals. The Bible talks about something called lawlessness, life with no boundaries. Because no boundaries and no law seems like freedom. But I don't want to live in a country with no laws. I don't want to live in a country with lawlessness lawlessness, because, see, your willingness to use boundaries is what keeps my freedom. (laughs) I can't be free if you're free to do do whatever you want to to me. So in order for everybody to have freedom, there's got to be some boundaries. And see, that's what morality is. Morality is boundaries. It's we go so far, but when we pass this line, it begins to infringe on the freedom of somebody else. It's protection for others, and it's protection for me. And that's important for us to get. But this is what I want us to see, and this is so important. See, God's laws are not for our restriction. God's laws are for our protection. See, we're talking about false morals. The only thing that matters is what's on my heart. No, that ain't necessarily true. That's false. But people will agree with that because it sounds good. It might sound good, but it's not good and sound. All that matters is not just what's on your heart. Your heart matters, but what's in your heart is going to show up. It's going to show up, number one, in my mouth. Matthew 12, 34 says, Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So when people just hurt you and lie and cheat and deceive or don't do what they're supposed to do, and then they say, God knows my heart. Oh, Lord, I got to go here. I got to go here because that saying just really gets me. Because what they really trying to imply when they say that is that there, there's, a little, there's a degree of righteousness and there's a degree of purity that ain't showing up in my hands. And what God's looking at is that. 
And what God's saying is, no, what's coming out your mouth and what's happening with your hand should be showing you what's going on in your heart. And I see that. It's just false morals. People just make up their own rules. It's okay, I'll just ignore what God says and make it up as I go along because I'm just not comfortable with it. See, that's deception. And deception leads to destruction. And God's like, I'm not trying to hinder you, I'm trying to help you. When he said don't live wild, he's trying to help you. When he said don't steal, he's trying to help you. When he said don't kill, he's trying to help you. All right, we got to go here. When he says forgive, he ain't trying to help the person that did you wrong, he's trying to help you. Am I making sense? All right, last one. I'm getting in trouble. I got I to gotta hurry up before I get in too much trouble. All right. <laughs> All right, last one, number seven. False unity. False unity. Mark 3, 24 says, If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And what the enemy likes to do is he likes to get organizations, he likes to get countries, and he likes to get churches operating in false unity deceived we think we won but we ain't Paul prays in the Corinthians I pray there's no schisms in the body he's talking about false unity and false unity is deception and it leads to death because unity is so important I say it all the time church at New Day I say this so much that you ought to know it by heart I will fight for you and I will fight with you for the unity in this body because you need unity and when, and when you need unity and you reach for it you need to be able to find unity when the bottom falls out, that's not when I need to find out you ain't with me. When my life is falling apart, I need to know I got family who won't look down on me and who won't judge me and who won't think less of me. I need unity. Oh, my Lord, church, I'm so passionate about unity. False unity in families, false unity in marriages, false unity in relationships, false unity in, in ministries, false unity in churches. Because, see, the enemy knows that unity is where the Lord commanded the blessing. <laughs> Come on, musicians, I'm done. Because, <laughs> see, I think most of you have heard me tell this. But a lot of times I get asked, I get asked questions about New Day all the time. And I get asked, one of the main questions I get asked is, why do you think you see the miracles you see around New Day? And I just got to be honest, church. I don't believe it's because of John Anders. And I don't believe it's because of Judy Rich. And I don't believe it's because of our praise and worship. And I don't believe it's because of our youth. And I don't believe it's because of our other ministries, although I think that all the ministries here are amazing ministries. But what I do believe is this. This is what I say every time I'm asked. It's... This is what I always say is the reason why we see the miracles we see. The reason why we experience the presence of the Lord every time we come together is because when you come to New Day, you step into a group of believers who's one body, who serve one king, who has one desire, who have one purpose. And our mission at New Day is to lift up the name of Jesus because he said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. Can we stand? So when we gather together, we gather in his name for his purpose. And we believe we're going to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And we are a unified body. And we do believe in miracles. The Lord is looking for two or three to come together in unity. And he'll come in the midst. On the day of Pentecost, they were all in one place, in one accord. And suddenly God showed up where there's unity. And in a lot of places, there's false unity, so there's false power. But here we have real unity, so there's real power. Not in us, but in the God we serve. But in order for there to be real unity, there's got to be real truth. So today, I don't know what your situation is, and I don't know where you're at. But I do know we're family, and I do know we're unified. So according to his word, he's here. And when he's here, answers are here. When he's here, restoration's here. When he's here, healing's here. Deliverance is here. So I want to pray. 
And then I'm going to ask God of will to come. So, Lord, I pray you open the eyes of understanding. Allow us to see whatever our need is. We've got family who can and who will agree with us. Lord, help us to have discernment. Help us see that the weapons the enemy's trying to use to destroy our life. Lord, let us understand the weapon might form, but we declare it will not prosper. We will not be deceived. We will lean into our brothers and sisters, and we will agree together that every need will be met. In Jesus' name. I don't know where you're at. I don't know what your need is. But I do know we got a God who's able. So I'm going to ask if you will, if you'll come. If you want to pray at the altar, come. If you want us to agree with you, come. If you want to just stand around the altar and worship, then come. But I want us to do something together as a family, church. As we're moving in this last leg of this corporate fast, can we just come together and do something as a family? Can we just come together and pray and worship? See, the Word of God demands a response. So whatever you do, respond to what the Lord's speaking to you. And I invite you, just gather around. Let's worship. Let's pray. Let's do something together as a family. And if you need prayer, we'll pray with you. If you want to worship, you just worship. This you is my worship. Altar, you pray at the altar. You just follow me. This is my offering. In every moment, I withhold nothing. I'm learning to trust you, even when I can't see you, and even in suffering, I have to believe it, if you say it's wrong, then I'll say no, if you say release, I'm letting go, if you're in it with me, I'll begin. When you say to jump, I'm diving in. If you say be still, then I will wait. If you say to trust, I will obey. I don't want to follow my own ways. I'm done chasing feelings. Spirit, be me. Spirit. 